bless his heart. I think he's backsliding. I think I saw him drink. Yeah, but in moderation. I just wasn't seeing much fruit. Yeah, he's going down a slippery slope. How's your heart, man? How's your heart? I'm just such a words guy. It was a total God thing. I'm blessed. I've been working on my testimony. Is that secular music? We're opening with a secular song tonight. Wait, is this a secular song? Isn't she secular? Which station's the fish? 104.3, the fish. Safe for the whole family. You know he's a believer. I think he's saved. I just pray you'd give him traveling mercies. Mm. Pray for all Tyler's unspokens. Mm. Echo that. I just really like to echo Tyler's prayer, Father. I just, I echo that echo of my echo of his echo. I really feel like I'm being released from this, you know? I'm trying to be relevant. I'm just trying to be in the world, not of it. Hey, do you want to join our small group? You want to join my D group? You want to join my cell group? Community group? Access group? Accountability group? Acts 27 group? Dude, he brought it. He brought the word. That service last night rocked me. They're pretty purpose driven. Yeah, it's seeker. Don't they do seeker service there? I feel like he's gotten really watered down. I don't feel like he really teaches the word. There's just not enough meat, you know? Are they non denom We have a great Wednesday night supper. Let's invite some dudes over and fellowship tonight. We're gonna have a sweet time of fellowshipping tonight. Dude, we had the sickest fellowship last night. We're going to extreme. Velocity. Ignite. Yeah, I'm going to ignite. The edge. The dive. The bridge. The ramp. Fire. Courageous. Passion. Echo. Reverb. Noise. Velocity. Drive. Elevate. Radiate. 722. 635. 419. Orange. Blue. Yellow. Green. Clear. Neon. Catalyst conference this year. I don't do that because I feel like it ruins my witness. So an atheist guy moves next door to an older widowed woman who's super religious. In fact, so religious that every day she comes out onto the front stoop of her front porch of her bungalow and shouts to God, praise the Lord, and either gives him a praise or a prayer request. And at first the, the atheist gentleman thought, how does she know I'm an atheist? She's doing this on purpose. But then it dawns on him, she does this every day and he's incredibly annoyed. So he goes over to her house once and says, you know, I, we haven't met, but I hear you every morning. It's early and it's all about God. And I'm an atheist. I don't mind you having a religion like this, but could you just pray a little quieter? It just, it's just really loud and it kind of bothers me. And she goes, you don't believe in God? He says, absolutely no. And she says, well, then your life probably could use the extra prayer that I'm giving it. And she's like, no, cut it out. And from then on, of course, they had a bad relationship, right? So. One morning, he's outside working in his garden, and he hears her shout from the tops, Good morning, God. Praise the Lord. The next morning, Good morning, God. My bunions hurt. Good morning, God. I need my sister to call me, Lord. Good morning, God. And he's, he's about to be driven crazy. One morning, he hears, Good morning, God. My food stamps ran out. Good morning, God. I'm getting hungry. Good morning, God. And he realizes, she's not going to give it up. So he goes to her and says, look, you keep, pray you keep praying for things out loud. Do you ever go do something yourself? Like, did you go to the doctor for your bunions? Did you call your own sister? And she's like, God will help me. And he's like, ugh. So the next day, he hears her once again going on about the food. Lord, I'm really getting low. Lord, please bring groceries. And he's like, ugh. So he decides, I'll teach her a lesson. He goes to the supermarket early in the morning before her usual morning prayer and brings groceries that she thinks an old religious lady would like, puts them on her front, front stoop, and then he hides in the shrubs waiting for her morning shout and prayer. She comes out, lifts her hands to God, and then she notices the bags of groceries. And so she says, good morning, God. Praise the Lord. Thank you for the groceries. And the man jumps out of the bushes and says, it wasn't God. There is no God. It was me, just me. And she says, thank you, Lord, that you made the devil pay for him. And so, so it is that I think our theology is probably somewhere in between the two where everything is, everything is about us asking God and counting miraculously that things will just appear and that nothing's about God and it's all up to us. I'm beginning a sermon series that Chris and I are going to do over the next four weeks called Christian Cliches That Drive God Crazy. And I believe this cliche, God helps those who help themselves, is one of those. Not because it's completely wrong, but because it's partially right, but Christians like us sometimes hide behind it 
to avoid doing the things that the atheist next door neighbor himself decided to do. And that is, be the answered prayer for the people who are in need. Now, if, if you ask me, I think the, the joke could turn into like a really better story if maybe there's a snowfall early in the winter and the neighbor, annoyed though he is, decides he's gonna shovel, the, shovel his neighbor's walk and so he shovels the sidewalk, the walk, maybe even the driveway, and then he leaves her a note that says, be careful, it's icy outside, sincerely, Satan. And then I think, oh, well, maybe they would then start a relationship, a little playful, they'd fall in love and get married, and then they would start a food delivery ministry out of Cop Prairie. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I should, should stick to pastoring, because, yeah, anyway. So anyway, that would, be, that would be a cool outcome. But once again, once again, it's based on the understanding that the cliches we have can be partially true, but there's enough wrong that if we let that seep inside of us, it can lead to some really bad theology growing out of it. So let's take a look at this first one. God helps those who help themselves. This is a, this is a saying and a concept that's been around probably since human beings first started thinking about their life. I guess I'm realizing that, you know, back in Neanderthal days, for instance, I can't imagine that, 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 people would want to help people who didn't help themselves. I mean, you figure like Larry the caveman, if he sits around all day painting, uh, painting on the cave walls, his friends, you know, Doug the deer hunter maybe, right? Fred the fisherman, right? They're not going to share their food with him if he's not trying to get some food himself. Now, maybe Doug the deer hunter will share with Fred the fisherman if it's been a, if it's a, a day where he can't catch anything, if he sees that he's normally trying to help himself feed his family. But nobody wants to contribute to people who don't seem like they're trying to help themselves. At the same time, if we think it's all about us, we miss the entire level of eternal truth that really does exist and the supernatural power that is ours if we participate in the story and the power of God. So today I want to suss through what parts of this saying point us to truth and which just kind of double back and point us back to ourselves. Where did it begin? I'm sure it didn't begin with Doug the deer hunter, right? There's some evidence that this was a saying that, ha that uh, was said in the ancient Greek world. Um, here's a, here's a, a picture I'd like you to look at there of, um, it's an English drawing of one of the gods, Hercules in this case, looking down on a, a, a wagon driver and telling him, fix the wagon yourself, dude. Oh, there's the there's the text. Interestingly, it's been popularized by Ben Franklin, God helps those who help themselves, but before Franklin got a hold of it or, or popularized it, it, uh, it was believed that, uh, what's his name, Algernon Sidney, a famous uh, 17th century, 1600s um, English political philosopher, he, had, he uh, quoted that in both lectures and books as well. Now, Algernon Sidney was kind of an interesting character. He and John Locke are considered the authors of two of the books that were kind of foundational to the Declaration of Independence, thinkers or uh, the people who signed it, and the uh, framers of the Constitution. So you've got you know, Madison, Madison Monroe, um, Hamilton, and that group. So it's a pretty, he's a pretty popular thinker. Interestingly about uh, Algernon Sidney, he was beheaded by the English king in uh, what time was it? Seven, 1689. Of course, I do take notes here. Where did I put it? 1683. But before he was beheaded, he did ask for a pardon from the king, king because he uh, claimed that the prosecutor um, in his case was unprofessional and, and wasn't fair and had misconduct, actually. The king refused. He was really mad at Sydney. So he got beheaded, but before he did, when he heard that he got uh, rejected, he said something like, the king can make a snuff box out of my... Um, backside, which uh, not super pretty picture. Anyway, so the, the phrase was picked up by Ben Franklin. I, I mean, I mean, God helps those, not the snuff box phrase, um, and, and popularized, and it has kind of seeped into our American consciousness. The, the good part of that is, is that it reminds us is no matter how much faith we have in Jesus, no matter how, quote, religious our life seems to be, we can't count on, nor should we, nor would it please God if we did, Count on him to just deliver like in a truck or bags on the porch everything we need. 
No, the Benedictine, the Benedictine monks have this uh, Latin phrase, ora et labora, prayer and labor. We need to pray like it's up to God, but work like it's up to us. That's part and parcel of our American consciousness. But, but there, is some, there is some reflection that I think is worth having on this because actually in, in the scriptures, in St. Paul, when he's, writing to the, when he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, where he had just planted and he had told them that the Lord was coming soon, what soon meant was up for some debate. And to be honest, historically, Paul probably thought the Lord's return was much, much quicker than the Lord had intended. So this whole church was thinking, God's coming soon. And a lot of those people decided they didn't need to work anymore. They decided to become unemployed, take it off, and then just either beg or scrounge or, or not be very useful contributors to that busy society in that city. So he writes this in verses uh, 6 or 9. I'm going to read you from the message, actually. Our orders, backed up by the Master Jesus, are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we taught you. Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. We showed you how to pull your own weight while, you were with, while we were with you, so get on with it. We didn't sit around on our hands expecting others to take care of us. In fact, we worked our fingers to the bone up half the night moonlighting so you wouldn't be burdened taking care of us. And it wasn't because we didn't have a right to your support. We sure did. We simply wanted to provide an example of diligence, hoping it would prove contagious. Don't you remember the rule that we had when we lived with you? If you don't work, you don't eat. And now we're getting report, reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you. This must not be tolerated, Paul wrote. We command them to get to work immediately. No excuses, no arguments, and earn their own keep. Friends, don't slack off in doing your duty. In this case, don't slack off in doing your duty to do your work and to chastise those who aren't willing to. If anyone refuses to obey our clear command written in this letter, don't let him get by with it. Point out such a person and refuse to subsidize his freeloading. Maybe then he'll think twice, but don't treat him as an enemy. This is important. Sit him down and talk about the problem with him as someone who cares. That, God helps those who help themselves. That seems to ring true, right? We, we know that the Lord is on our side if we follow him. We know that God is gonna protect and guide us and lead us and wrap his arms around us even when things are falling apart in our lives. But he does expect us to pray because it is up to him, but work because it is also up to us. So there is, a, there is some truth in this cliche. The problem with the cliche, and the reason I think that it drives God crazy, is that there's some untruth to it, or there's a kernel of truth that if we plant it in the soil of selfishness, I don't know about you, but I've got a big soil, I've got a big garden patch of selfishness in my own life. Um, if, we, if we let it take root there, it's quite possible that, that our whole garden will be overcome with this, this sense of entitlement and self-righteousness and, and indignation about people who don't work as hard as we do or aren't as successful as we are or whom we just don't understand. And I think there's a couple of ways in which then this becomes something bad. And the first one is I would call is the bot BS, born on third base syndrome. I, I, I don't know if that's a real thing. I just made it up. But if you remember or you've heard of, in 1988, Texas Governor Ann Richards made this joke about uh, the older George Bush as he was running for the first time for president of the United States after the Reagan years. And, and her joke was something like, um, George Bush was uh, born on third base, but he thought he hit a triple. And that kind of stuck, and it, it kind of weaved its way into the American consciousness of people who are really lucky to have good genes, good educations, lots of money, good connections, and then they do well. And it's easy when you have that much going for you. Like the, the current word that I think is fair to use is privilege, right? When you have that much privilege, when you have that much good luck, it's really easy to overestimate your skills, your smarts, your risk readiness, your resume, your hard work, and, and underestimate or underjudge the amount of good luck that you've had. Now, I, I, in fact, I thought George H.W. Bush was a pretty good president, a lot smarter than, uh, well, I, I won't compare him to any other family members. He was a good president, right? Um, but if we think 
and I'm not saying he did think this, this was a, his uh, a, a political opponent who said it, if we think just because we have life going well that we're the ones who got here, we are in danger of, of devaluing and almost denying the God who pours blessings on us undeservedly. You know, there's a story in, in the Old Testament about Nabal, who is called, the word Nabal in Hebrew means fool. Nabal the fool, who treated David while, before he was king, while he was still a kind of a vagabond, vagabond no, not, a guerrilla warrior shepherd leader. Um, he treated David disrespectfully because he didn't think that he worked hard enough or, or he wasn't willing to share his good fortune. Nabal was kind of a third base guy. Based on his character, I doubt that he got a triple. He probably was born there. Um, he slights David and David gets so mad he's going to slay him and his whole family. Now, luckily, Nabal married well and his wife Abigail intervened and things turned out okay. Um, Nabal ended up dying of a heart attack because he was so incensed that his wife embarrassed him by intervening, but it saved the whole household, so it was a good move. Anyway, let me, let me just read you a little bit of how this, uh, how this interchange happened. This is in 1 Samuel 25. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, this is David saying to his men to tell Nabal, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, the, this, this highland, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, please be favorable toward my men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son, David, whatever you can find for them. So when David's men arrived at Nabal's big farm, they gave him this message in David's name, and they waited for his response. And this is how David answered, this is how Nabal answered David's servants. Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. You see the kind of uh, talking points he probably heard in his uh, news bubble. Um, why should I take my bread and water and the meat I've slaughtered from my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? This almost led to his own murder and the execution of his whole family. Now, it doesn't reflect well on David that he got that mad that quick. Um, and luckily, by the time he became king of Israel, he grew up, matured, and settled down. But it does show you the heart of somebody who thinks they worked for it all, and so it belongs all to them. So if we, if we go around thinking God helps those who help themselves, and I've done well because I help myself, and so God must be happy with me, we risk forgetting that all that we have comes as a gift from God, and that if we don't live in a spirit of thankfulness, gratitude, and proportionality, God doesn't smile on people who live in excess. God doesn't smile on people who hoard and think it's all theirs. God doesn't smile on people who aren't as generous with others as he has been with them. If we live by this motto and then in, imply to others that if they're doing poorly, it's because they didn't work as hard as we did, we're being nables. We're being fools. And we're setting up, if not our family directly, maybe our society, maybe our economy, maybe our world, for the angry retribution of forces beyond our ability to control because somehow we thought it all was our doing. So the, so the, the major and most dangerous way from a big picture perspective that this cliche drives God crazy is it leads people of privilege people like me, people like you, it leads us to think that we did most of this ourselves and that the people who don't have the same success, blessings, privilege, position that we have did something wrong or they didn't do it as well as we did. And that, Scripture alludes, is foolish. And of course then, uh, Abigail married David after, his, after her husband died, so it just trickles down bad when you're that sort of fool. The, other, the second thing that happens if we believe this cliche, if we let it seep into our consciousness, is that sometimes 
If we realize we should help ourselves, and with part of us we want to help ourselves, but there's some heaviness of spirit, there's some brokenness or hurt or wound inside of us that's preventing us from helping ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that just because we feel bad because bad things have happened means we don't need to work. It doesn't mean there's a, a doctor's excuse for everybody who's demoralized or depressed because things didn't work out at work or in their family. Or, but it does mean that sometimes there's such a heaviness of spirit, so many roadblocks in front of us, even if they're of our own doing, that we feel not only bad about the situation we're in, but we feel ashamed of the person we've become in this situation. We might feel guilty for the decisions that got us here, but we feel so overwhelmed, so burdened by this heavy anchor around our neck that we can't help ourselves like God would want us to, like God prays we will. This is, this is no small thing. So, so I'd like to take this cliche, God helps those who help themselves, and, and kind of suggest a, a ricochet Let's agree that part of it is super helpful, but part of it can cut. Cut down our healthy theology, cut down a healthy society, and cut down our attempts to grow into the person that God wants us to be. I think it might be more fair to say, rather than God helps those who help themselves, is simply life helps those who help themselves. I mean, really, there are plenty of op there's plenty of examples in history of people who help themselves in ways that are not God-honoring. I mean, you think of the, the stories of complicity in Nazi Germany, where it was in everybody's interest once the government started becoming more and more fascist and the, and the anti-Jewish pogroms started where they were committing in, in front of their very eyes this horrific, ungodly, satanic, satanic spawned genocide, all the regular people that just didn't speak up because it could cost them a lot. And so they let it keep happening. They signed up to help it happen. These are all cases of people helping themselves. But this is not God helping themselves. Terrible things can happen. I think because life is full of unfairness and this world has a lot of Satan in it, I think it's fair to say that, yeah, life helps those who help themselves. Sometimes God do. But let's not say that everybody who helps themselves is doing so in partnership with God. Clearly not. So life helps those who help themselves. What God helps, though, God helps those who help others. And how does God help those who help others? I'm going to suggest there's three, uh, there's, there's countless ways, but I want to suggest three that seem, <clears throat> that seem relevant right now. One is God helps those who are, who are feeling down, beaten down, like this last category that I mentioned of people who just can't help themselves in the way that those of us who don't feel beat down could. When people are feeling that down, so beaten, or when, when unfairness or misfortune has really knocked their legs out, God helps those who help others. Because when we help others, even in our own distress, when we comfort others with the same comfort God, ourself, God himself has comforted us with, God heals them. God heals them by giving them confidence and significance. God helps those who help others. And when those people are the ones who are down, God helps them by healing them. The other group, God helps those who help others when they're feeling up, when they're on top of the world, when they think this is, ever look at all that my hard work has accomplished. I built this, the saying goes right? I built this. When it's all on me, when I'm feeling so pleased with myself, so, so excited that my choices turned out right, so grateful and so cocky that my choices, my ambition, my risks have all paid off well, God helps those who help others when they're feeling proud and cocky because God humbles them. Pride cometh before a fall, right? But when God humbles a man, he lives long and righteously. Man, women too, right? When God humbles us, we have a chance to see life clearly and to see Him clearly. So God helps those who help others. He raises us up when we're down and heals us. He lowers us when we're too far up and humbles us. But for the vast majority of us who are kind of struggling somewhere in the middle of all that, 
we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to get by. We've got some wins and some losses. We got days when we think it's going well and we're patting ourselves on the back and we have days when we think nothing's gonna work out and we, we can't figure out what to do. When we're in that sort of place, when we're comfy in the middle and we're not attentive to God, when we're feeling independent of God, when it feels like it's all on us, God helps those who help others by hallowing us and our lives. Now you're like, what does hallow mean? Don't we say that in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The prayer is that we would make God's name special and holy, that we would treat God's name with a reverence, that would give it the significance and the honor it's des it deserves. This is what happens when we help others. God helps those who help others by hallowing us. Because in the very act of helping, of, of serving, of loving a brother and sister, of, of sacrificing for them, of being generous toward them, not just with money, but with our spirit, with our forgiveness, when we do that, we become more the image of God, hallowed in his eyes and hallowed in our own. So I'd like you to close, I'd like to close with this. God helps those who help themselves is not probably an accurate way to look at life. But, but the cross is a cruciform life, meaning cross-formed. Psalm 32 gives us this suggestion in verse 6 and 7. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. This is David's prayer. The same David who forgave that cocky fool named Nabal when he was a young man, when he was an older man. He, he wrote these words that he himself, despite all his power, smarts, and his followings, he realized that it was God who was his hiding place, that God is his source of protection in times of trouble, that God is his deliverance. That sort of humility, even with the other pretty significant moral failings of this man. That sort of humility kept him in a place that God can continue to help. So that's the vertical form of the cross, the, the horizontal one that makes a cruciformed life. I want to take from St. Paul. This is a, a popular passage. You hear those of us, um, not just me and Chris, but the other staff at Caught Prayer, we say this a lot because it, it hearkens to the reality that we are part of a body of Christ. And even though some of us have maybe more money than others, some of us have more leadership than others, some of us have more, I don't know, joys or successes or resumes than others, we are all critical to the plan that God has to redeem the world with us. This is Paul writing in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, to the cliches that drive God crazy, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That cliche, God helps those who help themselves, makes it sound like we're all in this race, like a big Hunger Games field. And, and the, the goal of life is to help ourselves to grab the resources, the tools, and to slay whoever's in our way so that we can end up on top. And the cliche gives this impression that God's going to bless that silliness when the reality is it will break God's heart to think that's how we chose to live our life. Brothers and sisters, God be praised from the front porch. He does answer prayers. But let us be humbled that it takes all of us. It takes a village to be the church. And we look forward in 2021, not only to being the church together, but making sure the table is big enough, our hearts are soft enough, <laughs> and the food is healthy enough that when we invite the world to come and taste and see that the Lord is good, they're tasting the real gospel of Jesus Christ and not a cliche that drives God crazy. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blessing it is to be your holy people, to be hallowed by your name, and to live lives that hallow you, Lord, with our love and sacrifice, our focus and our attention, not just on our own needs, but on those of the world you point us to. Lord, you did call us to work, to, to labor in the ways that you've equipped us for, but you've also called us, Lord, to, to pray when, when the work is not enough, to pray after the work is done, and to pray, Lord, before the work begins. Help us, like the Benedictine said, practice ora et labora, prayer and work, so that together, Lord, we might be the partners you desire to change this world with your blessed and holy love. And all God's people said, whether it's from their front porch or just here in your living room, amen. <laughs> we'll see you next week.